The Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12, verse 18, is where we begin. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Mark chapter 12, verse 18. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. The Sadducees were a religious sect in Israel, <clears throat> like the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Sadducees, though, were the theological liberals. They didn't believe in a resurrection or in life after death. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in the supernatural. It's not surprising, therefore, I suppose, that they were in favor of making the most out of this life by being materialistic. My only question for the Sadducees, I guess, would be, why do you call yourself a religious sect? Because the way I see it, they believed in a religion of nothing. Verse 19, Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. And that's true. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, the Bible says that if a man died without children, then his brother was to marry his widow. And then the first son of that marriage was considered the son of the dead brother. Well, look at verse 20. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? This highly unlikely scenario was designed to make fun of the doctrine of the resurrection. You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in anything that they couldn't figure out. They were rationalists. Consequently, they rejected the resurrection because they couldn't figure out how God could possibly work out the details. Well, the Bible teaches the resurrection. The Word of God teaches the resurrection. There's no doubt about that. That should be the starting place. And so the Sadducees should have uh, what they should have done is just believe the Word of God and accepted the fact that they were not as smart as God and that's why they couldn't figure out all the details surrounding the resurrection. We don't have to know everything. The important thing is to know that everything in the Bible is true because it's the Word of God, whether we can figure it out or not. Verse 24. And verse 24 says, Jesus replied, You, or are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? They may have known what the Bible said here and there, but they didn't know the scriptures. In other words, they didn't understand the Bible. And they didn't know the power of God either. They had reduced God to their level. And the way they figured, if they couldn't figure something out, then neither could God. They didn't know the power of God. And if, the, and if the Sadducees couldn't see it, touch it, hear it, or smell it, then they didn't believe in it. What a hopeless, meaningless existence they must have had. But you know, that's not even the worst part. The worst part is that since they didn't believe the Word of God, they didn't believe in anything beyond this life either. And that meant they didn't prepare for the next life, which meant they rejected the Savior Jesus, which meant that they went to hell after they died. And now, you know what? They believe in life after death. Well, it's too late for them to do anything about it, but they believe in it. Believe it or not, there is a heaven and there is a hell. 25. When the dead rise, Jesus said, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. No one will get married in eternity. And so in that way, we will be like the angels. We'll still be men and we'll still be women. We'll still be who we are. 
Any child conceived in this world will be in the next. However, like the angels, no one will get married and have children in eternity. 26. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Jesus is about to prove from Scripture that there is life after death. In fact, he is proving from Scripture that there is life after death. <clears throat> by the time of Moses, by the time Moses came along, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been physically dead for centuries. But according to Jesus, they had not gone out of existence. Physically dead? Yes. Gone out of existence? No. If they had ceased to exist, then God would not have told Moses that he was still their God. You see, God cannot have a relationship with someone who doesn't exist. And so whether the Sadducees believe it or not, there is life after death, and consequently, they ought to get ready for it. Verse 28. Verse 28 says, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The teachers of the law, also called the scribes, had divided the law of Moses into 613 rules of conduct. And then they would spend hours arguing over which one of them was the most important. And now they want Jesus to get in on the debate. 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The Bible says that we are to fear God. The Bible says that we are to honor God. The Bible says we are to worship God and serve God and not grieve God. But none of those things are as important to God as us loving Him. If we love Him, then we care about Him. And we will want to do what makes Him happy. And so by far the greatest thing we can do with our life is to live it to please God. In response to His goodness towards us. That is loving God. 31. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. In other words, care about others as much as you care about yourself. Put yourself in the other person's shoes and ask, how would I like to be treated? And then treat them that way. It's very uncomplicated. 32, well said, teacher. The man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him and to love Him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Yep, the most important thing we can do is love God and love others. All the other commandments concerning our relationships with people and God will automatically be kept if we obey those two commandments. 34. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And so that scribe was close to the kingdom of God. In other words, he was close to being saved. But you know, he was not saved. He was sincere. He also knew that loving God was the uh, more, most important thing, was more important than anything else. Even the religious offerings that he mentioned. And so that's a good start, but it's not enough. He was just close to the kingdom of God. Believing the correct things may get a person close to being saved. However, close will not make the flames of hell any less hot person has to believe the correct things, that's true. But, yeah, believe the correct things about Jesus, but also follow through with repentance and receiving Him as our Lord and Savior. 
Last part of verse 34, and from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. All the attempts by the religious rulers to trip Christ up failed, so they finally quit trying. Verse 35, while Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, how is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? The Jewish leaders expected the Messiah to be a human king a descendant of King David. And they were correct about that. And what they didn't understand, however, is that the Messiah would also be God. And so let's look at this again. How is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus quotes what David wrote in the Bible under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he wrote this, The Lord, that would be God, said to my Lord, referring to the coming Messiah, what did he say? Sit at my right hand. In other words, David wrote in Scripture that God the Father would tell the Messiah to sit at his right hand. Now keep in mind that in those days the right side of the king's throne was reserved for the person who could act in the king's place. He, he'd have to be up to the job. Conclusion, Jesus has to be both Messiah and God because no one but God could sit in for God. No one but God could sit at God's right hand. So Jesus is proclaiming his deity here and he's not finished. 37. Again, it says, David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? Jesus wants these people to think. Think about that. You see, the way fathers and grandfathers were honored in those days and in that culture, no one would ever think of calling a son or a grandson Lord. It just would never happen. No matter what position they might have in, have in life, it would never happen. And so here you have David referring to his great-great-great-grandson, the Messiah, as Lord. How can that be? I mean, that would be unthinkable unless that offspring was God as well as man. And so Jesus is proving by the scripture that he, the Messiah, is the son of David and also the son of God, that is, God. And verse 38. As he taught, verse 38 says, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces. The uh, religious leaders in their long flowing robes. You know, those robes were supposed to be worn while doing their religious duties and that's it. But the scribes wore them all the time, hoping to impress others. You know what that would be like? That would be like the Packer players wearing their helmets, their uniforms, pads and all, into the local Mar Walmart in Green Bay. That's what that would be. I mean, it would just be a little bit obvious that they were trying to, you know, display themselves. Verse 38 and 39. Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the more, most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets all the high and mighty religious rulers they loved all the uh, special privileges and all the honor that they received because of their position they thought of themselves as being religious superstars verse 40 they devour widows houses so they acted so pious they tried to look so holy but they did some very bad things. For starters, they would even smooth talk gullible widows into, into giving them their life savings for safekeeping, of course. And then they would spend, spend the uh, money on themselves. And that's not all they did. And for a show, they'd make lengthy prayers. And so they would also pray long, drawn-out public prayers. But those prayers were not conversations with God. God never heard them because they weren't even directed to God. 
They were a one-man show. They were an attempt to get people to think that they were holy. That's all it was. Everything was for show. The last part of verse 40, Jesus says, Such men will be punished most severely. And I'll tell you what, preachers and pastors will answer to God for what they teach and how they behave. And those who use their position to promote self instead of serving God and promoting Jesus Christ will feel the wrath of God according to Jesus. The ministry is not an entertainment industry. 41. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. There were 13 containers in the temple complex where people could drop in their offerings. And so Jesus and his men were in that area watching people. It says many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins with only a fraction of a penny. Nothing wrong with the rich putting in large amounts. It's just that they stood back when they gave and they, and they had people blow a trumpet and announce that they were giving. That was the problem with them. But take a look at this poor widow. The word poor means very poor. It actually means pauper. And so this poor widow was in financial ruin. But she gave God the little that she had. 43. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. And Jesus wasn't talking dollar-wise, because her gift was tiny in amount. Those two little coins that she gave amounted to one sixty-fourth of a normal person's daily wage. A very small amount when measured by God's stand or by man's standards, but when measured in relation to sacrifice, it was huge. And God noticed that. You know, God doesn't just measure our gifts to him by how much we give. He measures it by what we give up in order to give it. You see. What a person gives up in order to give the money to God is something that the Lord doesn't overlook. I mean, if you buy a McDouble off the dollar menu, and you and instead and you buy that for a buck, instead of the Big Mac meal, which whatever costs six bucks or whatever it might be, be and you give the difference to God, He notices that. That's what we're talking about here. 43. Jesus sat down opposite. Oops, I'm sorry. I went backwards. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And so clearly it pleases the Lord. And he takes note when his people give beyond the point of comfort like this poor widow. It takes faith to do that, you know. It takes faith and it takes a heart for God. In fact, it takes a heart for God to give. Period. It just does. Faithful givers are faithful Christians. Where your treasure is. There will your heart be also, said Jesus. Chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And it's true, the temple complex was one of the wonders of the ancient world, actually. The buildings were made of marble. The eastern wall of the temple was all gold-plated in order to reflect the sunrise. Verse 2, Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So it's true that the temple complex was a magnificent sight. But it 
it will soon be destroyed because the people involved were not living for God. And it happened. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. A million Jews were slaughtered and the temple was taken apart stone by stone just exactly as Jesus predicted it would be. Three, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? The disciples believed that Jesus would establish the earthly kingdom of God within days, probably before the Passover feast ended. And so they want to know exactly when the temple will be destroyed and when the kingdom will be established. And they also want to know what to look for in the way of signs. And they're probably expecting Jesus to say, well, there's going to be darkness at midday, or maybe a brilliant angel with a trumpet will proclaim the start of the kingdom of God, something like that. Five, Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. Now Jesus is talking about the time between his ascension and his return to earth. During that interval, which is the time that we're in right now, there will be many who pretend to be him and many deceivers who claim to speak for him. And Jesus says, do not be deceived by them. And you stick to the Bible and you will not be deceived. God says to the law and the prophets, if they do not speak according to that word, then they have no light in them. The truths which separate Christianity from false religions are very clear in Scripture. They don't have to be interpreted. They just have to be read. 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. During the church age there will be many wars. But Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Wars by themselves are not a sign of his return. And yet amazingly, many books are written by opportunists every single time war breaks out. Especially when it breaks out in the Middle East. It's incredible. The catalogs of Christian booksellers are stuffed with books, with titles, that include the words Middle East, Antichrist, Oil, War, Terrorism, Ayatollah, Iran, Iraq, Rapture, Second Coming. And they're big sellers too. And it just amazes me. Lots of tainted money can be made by prophetic hype. But war, even war in the Middle East, is not necessarily a sign of the return of Christ. Jesus said the end is not yet. Wars are the norm. Not just for this present age, but since the fall of man. You know, the First World War, World War occurred when Cain killed his brother Abel. And it's been going on ever since. Verse 8. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pangs. So all of these things will happen during the present church age talking about earthquakes and famines and you can throw in tsunamis and tornadoes and hurricanes and all the rest talking about natural disasters they've been happening for thousands of years and so like war natural disasters are not necessarily a sign that the Lord will return soon now Jesus does refer to them as birth pangs which means that they will become more frequent and more intense as his return draws near, especially in the final few days. But what Jesus has been describing here is what the world in general will experience during this present church age. Next up, what his followers can expect during this age, and for that we'll have to wait till next time.